So since next Sunday is Easter, that means that today is Palm Sunday, right? So this is the day that we celebrate and we remember Jesus' triumphant entry uh, into Jerusalem and the start of the Passion Week, which is, of course, the countdown to the cross, and then the cross is the countdown to the resurrection. And it's crazy to think about all the scriptures that were fulfilled right then, really over the course of Jesus' life. You know, it's somewhere over 300 uh, particular prophecies that he fulfilled in his life, and this was a big one on Palm Sunday, very dramatic from Zechariah 9.9, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on, the, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Palm Sunday. But it's not, the, it's not like the, the riding in, like the millennial reign writing in it, it, it's not the prelude to to the to the one world government under the the true king under the messiah it, it's not the prelude to that as a matter of fact it's just an introduction to the cross it's a gateway to suffering and death of our messiah and so it's kind of crazy to think about because you know, you got all these prophecies that were written and Jesus fulfilling them. And then the people there, they look and they see Jesus writing it. And they've got this in his mind. And the people, are they're, they're throwing their, their, their cloaks on the ground. They're grabbing the branches. And they're saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Like, this is it. This is it. And they still missed it. And you say, okay, well, why did they do that? Why, how, did they, how can you possibly miss this? And part of it is that, you know, it was God's perfect plan for the cross because that was the way that he had written for atonement, right? The wages of sin is death, and so that's a huge part of it. But then how did the religious leaders who should have been looking for the Messiah, how did they miss it? How, why in the world were they shouting, crucify him, when they should have been ready to crown him with glory? How could they go from 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 these were the people that were charged with governing God's plan on the earth. They knew the law of God, and yet they rejected his word. And if you dig in to the story of the priests and the religious leaders at the time, you see the same sad story that you and I are probably just too familiar with. Right? Because we see examples every day in our prodigals and we look around and we see it in our nation as we look at the news. And, and honestly, as we've looked through the story of Saul these past couple of weeks, I think we can see the same story. And we're going to round out Saul's journey today by, by looking at, at this downward spiral that has a whole lot in common with the same reason that the religious leaders rejected Jesus as the Messiah. It's got a whole lot in common with, with what we're facing in our society as people have rejected the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The rejection of God's identity, a slippery slope then into sin and death. And the truth of the matter is that hell is never satisfied. Habakkuk 2.5 talks about it expanding its borders because hell and death are never satisfied. So like Saul, the Pharisees, the religious leaders did not start out to reject the Messiah, but because they didn't want to accept the word of God, they opened themselves up for death and destruction. Nature hates a vacuum and hell is never satisfied. So like Israel was taken from Saul and given to David, the governance of the kingdom on earth was then taken from the Levites and then given to the church, right? That's the story of, of, of Palm Sunday and the rejection leading, leading to the crucifixion and, and the birth of the church and all of those things. But, but can I tell you that, that Saul didn't want it. Didn't, Saul didn't want this to happen. The religious leaders, I don't think they, they, they wanted it to happen. If they, could, if they could have a bird's eye view and, and they could see that Jesus really was the Messiah and they could see that, that, that they would lose the governance of, the, of God's activity on the earth as it's passed to the church, they wouldn't, they wouldn't have liked that. That's not what they intended. But it's what happened because hell never has enough. 
for Saul, it was a minor disobedience that led to greater disobedience. And he was hiding in the equipment, and that led to an unlawful sacrifice. And the unlawful sacrifice led to a blatant rejection of God's commands. And then from there, things go from bad to worse because nature hates a vacuum and hell is never satisfied. The story of Saul, we see it's a tragic free fall from that point on to the end. And it's very similar to the ending that we see for the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the religious leaders that rejected Jesus. And it's very similar to what we see happening in our own prodigals and what we see happening in our society around us. It's a very slippery slope. For those who reject the things of God, it's a ditch without a bottom. So today, guys, we're going to finish the story of Saul. We're going to see how this thing plays out. We're going to draw a whole lot of parallels, not just between what happened post-Palm Sunday, but what we see happening in our society today and what will continue to happen as we look forward to the coming of Jesus. So uh, for the previous weeks, guys, I've, uh, as we've looked through the story of Saul, I've said that I can see myself in Saul a lot, and, and I think we can all you know, sympathize with him a little bit, sometimes, you know, having quite a bit of insecurity, sometimes jumping to conclusions and doing things really outside of the plan of God because we needed to act right then. And, and sometimes, and I hope, I hope never, but, but, but the Lord would, would, would probably correct me, except, you know, his memory has been cut short by his grace, thankfully. But, but hopefully I never find myself in, a, in such a blatant disobedience as what we looked at with Saul yesterday. But what we're going to look at today, I hope I never identify with. And by the grace of God, I won't. And same thing for us, the church. But I tell you, this is what will happen to, the, it's what is happening right now to our world. It's what is happening to our prodigals and the people that we love who have rejected the plan of God. It's the pattern of the lost, those who have rejected the things of God. It's a slippery slope because hell is never satisfied. So today, it's the end of Saul's story. And it's what I see unfolding now as we await the last days and our society moves further and further from God's presence. Let's look again at uh, 1 Samuel chapter number 15. We'll, we'll look at this passage again and, and we'll see where it goes. 1 Samuel 15 verse 22. Uh, we read this last week, but, but it's just so heartbreaking. This is Samuel and he's confronting Saul. This is after he, remember the, the story last week, uh, God commands Saul and the Israelites to go and attack the, the Amalekites and, and utterly destroy them. And instead, he leaves Agag and, and the best. He was the king. He, so he leaves the king and the best of the stuff. And God says, why did you do this? I told you to do something, and you did the opposite. Why? We looked at that last week, but this is, the, this is the conversation that Samuel has as he confronts Saul in this blatant disobedience. And Samuel says, Has the Lord as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices and, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than to sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the, the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness as the iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from being king. Verse 27, Samuel turned around to go away, and Saul seized the edge of his robe, and he tore it. And Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. So Saul rejected God. And so then God then rejected Saul. And what we see in the, in the following chapters is that the Spirit of God had departed from Saul. The anointing left. And then that void, because nature hates a vacuum and hell is never satisfied, that void where there was anointing, where there was the Spirit of God, that anointing was filled by works of the flesh and by evils of the enemy. The same was true for the religious leaders that, that rejected Jesus as the Messiah. The same is, is true for us in a society that has rejected the things of God. Nature hates a vacuum and hell is never satisfied. There's some consequences when the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord departs. 
We see these in the story of Saul. We see it in the Passion Week, and we see it unfolding all around us. These are true but not comfortable. This is the spiral of Saul. After the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, the first consequence that we run into in in chapter number 16 is torment and unrest. Oh, man. Chapter 16, verse 14, Now the Spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. And Saul's attendants said, See, an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord command his servants here to search for someone who can play the lyre, and when uh, he will play when the spirit when the evil spirit from God comes on you, and you will feel better. Now, you could read the whole story, and, and it's, it's, it's long, but I definitely recommend it. Here's what happened first. The Spirit of the Lord departs from, from Saul. An evil spirit comes to torment him. Instead of trying to get rid of that, he's looking for a Band-Aid, something to feel better. Right? He searched for reprieve, not, not for healing, but for just a little reprieve. He was looking for something to make him feel better at the moment. And if that's not a, moder- uh, like a character sketch of our modern society, I don't know what is. This is, tr- this is tough. But guys, in the last days, people have rejected the Spirit of God. Our society, the, the nature or the human nature, the flesh man has risen up and rejected the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We've rejected the call of the Holy Spirit. And because of that, tormenting spirits from the enemy have invaded. Now, okay, so this is one of those messages where you preach and you're like, man, I hope people don't think I'm crazy. I'm not one of these kind of people that think that there's a demon behind every rock, right? And I I truly believe that folks have problems and not all of them are spiritual, right? There, there, There are true depressions. There are chemical imbalances. There are all kinds of things that happen that are not spiritual. They're, they're emotional. They're physical. They're biological. They're chemical. I don't know. Those things do exist, okay? But we also have to say, because it's, it's in the Word of God and it's true, that when the Spirit of God departs, nature hates a vacuum and hell is never satisfied. So there are tormenting spirits that come upon us. And for a society that has rejected the things of God, i got to believe that some of this anxiety, some of this depression, some of this junk and garbage is nothing but an attack and an indwelling of the enemy because we have left space as we've rejected the plan of God, as we've rejected the Holy Spirit, we've allowed other spirits to come in. Not everything is spiritual, but a lot is. And spiritual problems have spiritual solutions. And then, like Saul, we find ourselves, and I say we, and I don't mean us, (laughs) society, right? The the people that that have rejected the Spirit of God, and and they're tormented by, by stuff straight from the pit of hell. And unfortunately, instead of running to, to, to Jesus, instead of looking for freedom, they're only looking for reprieve. And so we see the legalization of marijuana, and we see the recreational drugs, and we see all of these things skyrocket because people have problems, and they're real. And some of them are driven by spiritual things. But instead of people looking for freedom, they're only looking for a little bit of reprieve for just a minute. If they could just zone out, if they could just self-medicate. We've got the words of life and deliverance, but the world doesn't want deliverance. They only want relief. And can I tell you, it's going to get worse. This is partially how, I personally believe this is partially how the Antichrist will be able to take power because people won't have any kind of fight left in them. He's going to show up and he's going to have some answers, a smooth-talking guy, why not? And nobody else is going to have any fight in them. They're just going to be so beaten down by, these, by, by the spirit of the age. We stand in opposition. We stand preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and we'll continue to do that until the church is taken out of the way. But can I tell you that the same downward spiral that happened to Saul will happen to the people that we love. This should, like, this should light your fire, right? 
This should make you bold to want to pull people out of this out of this pit because the same downward spiral that happened to Saul happens to our prodigals, people that we know, people that we pray for. If they reject the things of God, there will be torment and unrest. Some of it driven straight from the from the pit of hell. It happens to the people we love. It happens to our society. It happens. To, to everyone who rejects the truth of the word of God because nature hates a vacuum and hell is never satisfied. Second thing that happens is jealousy. And jealousy leads to violence. The story of Saul, man, it, it gets really messed up. So as soon as the kingdom is torn from him and, and the anointing departs, then, then an evil spirit comes and torments him and there is no rest. And i got to believe that he mourns for what he lost at this point because he remembers when he had peace. He remembered when he walked in fellowship with God under the anointing. And that made it all the more painful when he looked at the other. You see, Saul gave up his anointing, but God didn't give up his promise, right? So God raised up David, a man after his own heart, to be king. And because of that, Saul hated David. Saul remembered what he had. He didn't have it anymore. He's under all this pressure, under all of this torment. And, and, and he's looking at David. David. Who was taken out of nothing and was raised up and given everything that Saul had. And he, Saul hated David because of it. Chapter 18, verse 12 says, Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with David and had departed from Saul. So he sent David away from him and, and gave him command over a thousand men. And David led the troops in their campaigns. And everything he did, he had great success because the Lord was with him. And when Saul saw how successful he was, he was afraid of him. Verse 29 says, Saul became still more afraid of him, and he remained his enemy for the rest of his days. Now, his enemy, it's actually kind of a mild way to say it. Matter of fact, if, if you continue to read this story, Saul hates David so much, is so jealous of him, that he tries to kill him on multiple occasions. Like throwing spears at him and all kinds of crazy stuff. Like this is some messed up stuff. Saul hated David because David had something that Saul used to have but was taken from him when he forfeited it. Honestly, I, I guess you could argue that one could argue that, that it was a similar jealousy that the religious leaders had that caused them to crucify Jesus. That for so long, the, the religious leaders were the, the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the teachers of the law. They, they understood the word of God and they preached that to the people. And that's what they had. But over the centuries, they had begun to reject the things of God, to, be, to reject the spirit of God. And then Jesus shows up full of the spirit, preaching truth. And part of that disconnect was jealousy. And that jealousy led to violence. Certainly did with Saul. It did with the religious leaders. And can I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, like this isn't like bunny rabbits and flowers kind of preaching. We'll talk about the resurrection next week, and it's going to be great. Right? But for today, let me tell you that in the last days, watch out. Because you and I, we, we're going to walk in peace. We're going to walk in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, all of the gifts of the Spirit. We're going to be blessed coming in and going out. We're going to be the head and not the tail. Everything we touch is going to prosper. I believe that. I believe that we will see the goodness of God in the land of the living. I believe that. I believe that we're going to have the Holy Spirit inside of us to do miracles, signs, and wonders, all kinds of amazing things. And you know who won't? The people that have rejected the gospel. Society in general, the world, uh, even some of our prodigals that we love very much will hate us very much. 
Because while we're walking in, in, in all of the, the fruits of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit, they're walking in torment. They'll be jealous of us. And they'll hate us. Some people will see that, that we have a relationship with God and, and they used to and, and they will be jealous of us. And can I tell you that it's already started on social media? Like, like this is like to say that there's violence. So jealousy leads to violence. That's what happened with Saul. That's what happened with Jesus. It hasn't really come to, to, to all out violence for us here in America yet. But you know what? The church around the world is suffering significant persecution and it will happen here. It's happening here in social media, right? The, we're, we're facing more and more, you know, every time you say something according to the Word of God, you're called a bigot or a racist or all these things that we're absolutely not. Matter of fact, to, to be a bigot or a racist would be sin against God. But that's what they're labeling us as because we stand for truth. And right now it's just a social media thing and okay, not that big a deal. But it's not going to be long where we're going to miss job opportunities. It's not going to be long where, where people really, really where it comes to blows against the church. I hope not. I wish not. But I read the end of the book and I think, you know, that's kind of where it's going. You know, uh, on Wednesday, we looked uh, through 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians, I forgot which Corinthians we're in. But it's toward the end, and, and we're, we're reading how Paul is suffering all of these, these crazy persecutions and trials and just overall tragedies. I mean, the dude is shipwrecked and in the sea and beaten and all these things. And all of that because of the gospel of Jesus. Can I tell you, Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. And I believe it. But it's not going to be sent by him. It's going to be sent by people that have rejected him. And there's, there's a friction between those that are following Jesus and those that are not. And somewhere in that friction... All right, so remember, guys, our war is not against people, right? It's spiritual. And when we're attacked by people, what we can't, what we can't think is that those people are against us. No, no, it's a spiritual, it's a spiritual thing, right? And yes, for us, there, there, there's, there's going to be a level of righteous indignation like Jesus going and, and throwing over tables. But, but guys, for us, there has to be a level of brokenness that the church has not experienced and, and generations when we are, are persecuted when we're marginalized when the world speaks against us when we miss opportunities when, when potentially even violence raises up hopefully it won't in our generation but someday it'll happen it'll happen right here when that happens guys we have to react by praying and being so broken and begging the Lord for revival and speaking truth in love and passion and anointing because that's the only tool that we have. The weapon that we have is not carnal, but it's might through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And that's what we've got to exercise. But just FYI, the spiral, when the Spirit of the Lord departs, Torment comes in. When torment comes in, there's jealousy that happens for people that are still walking in peace. That, that jealousy can lead to violence. And it keeps going downhill from there. Just when you think it can't get any worse, you see the end of Saul's story. And this is actually going to bring us to the end of the age, according to the Bible also, because... The last thing that we see is spiritualism leading to divination. Wickedness in high places. Again, nature hates a vacuum. When the Spirit of the Lord departs, there's still a desire to connect with the spiritual realms. See, humans are wired to be spiritual. We are spiritual beings living in a body, right? But, but there is something inside of us that desires, that, that desires God, that desires what's out there. And when we as people reject the Spirit of God, then we're hungry for something else. In Saul's life, again, downward spiral. He's, he's fighting against David, literally coming to blows, like, like trying to kill him for years. And it just keeps on continuing. And then finally... 
toward the end of his life, we see him at the peak of his depravity in Sam, 1 Samuel chapter 28 when he goes to visit a medium, a witch. And Saul, when Saul saw the Philistine army, he was afraid. He was filled with terror in his heart. He inquired of the Lord, but the Lord didn't answer him. Why? Because the Spirit of the Lord had departed. And by this time, he was only treating the, the, the Spirit of the Lord like a, like a magic eight ball, right? He, he's just wanting answers. And so, so God doesn't answer because there's no relationship there. The Lord didn't answer him by dreams or Urim or by, by the prophets. And so Saul said to his attendants, okay, fine, if the Spirit of the Lord isn't going to answer me, then find me a medium so that I can inquire of him. Find me a witch. And, you know, the story, maybe you don't, but you should read it. Like, it's, it's a messed up story. Saul has a really messed up life. And he goes to a witch, and she raises up the spirit of Samuel. And it's this whole thing. Like, it's, it's a messed up story. And we see the end of Saul's rejection of God. Saul rejected God in the little things at first, and then it got bigger and bigger and bigger. And then finally, when he rejected God so much that the glory that the anointing departed, he went, he went down this, this thing that, that I believe our society is sliding in very, very quickly. Very quickly. The last step on on Saul's journey was engaging spirits that are not from God. You say, well, Pastor Jeremy, we don't see that yet. Well, kind of do. You know, um, a long time ago, uh, you'd hear people preach against you know, Harry Potter and things like that. And now we just kind of accept it like, oh, it's just a thing. Okay, but it's introducing some spiritual things. And you see people kind of messing around, and they got the, the Ouija boards and all the, the stuff that you mess with. And, and some people think it's kind of fun. It's kind of not. It's, it's, it's fun or not fun. You, you cruise through the channels. You see the ghost hunters. You see all people are, are interested in stuff, Scientology, the whole nine yards. They're interested in spiritual things at the same time as they're rejecting the gospel of Jesus. And so what's going to happen According to, according to the word of God is that in the last days there'll be the antichrist and there'll be the false prophet and there'll be lying signs and wonders and people will be deceived why? because everyone is looking for something in the spirit of God and if, if you've rejected the spirit of God then the only thing left is spirits of, of divination and deception that will ultimately only bring glory to Satan himself. I feel like we should hurry up and get to the Easter part because this is kind of like a heavy one, right? But this is the end of Saul's story. A downward spiral because nature hates a vacuum and hell is never satisfied. And the enemy never misses an opportunity. So what we see happening with Saul is what we saw happening with the religious leaders and the reason that they rejected Jesus. And it's what we're going to see out, is what we're going to see unfold with us in these last days. That those that reject Jesus will go through a period of, of turmoil and internal conflict and torment, you could even say. And that's going to lead to some jealousy. That jealousy, as they completely reject the church, is going to open them up to other means of, of connecting with spiritual things. And that's going to lead them into a grave deception. Okay, well, Pastor Jeremy, what do we do about it? Like that's, what do we do? Well, I think there's value in just being aware. value in being awake. Because in that, we're spurred to first guard 
the anointing that we have in our lives. In us personally, in our homes, in our families, in our churches, everywhere we can, we've got to guard the Spirit of the Lord. We've got to, we've got to make sure that there's nothing that would come in that would try to, to offend God, that, that there's no unrepentant sin or anything that would, that would create a vacuum of the Spirit that, that could be filled with all this other junk and all these consequences. We've got to be wise with discernment to see that, that the problems that we that we observe around us, right? We live in some problems, but can I tell you that the problems that we're living in are not political or financial or, or environmental, they're spiritual. So we've got to resist those things. Not not in the ways that the world resists those things, but but doing war in the spirit to stand in the gap, to make up the hedge. There's going to be a moment as, as all of this stuff winds down. There's going to be a moment when the church is taken away and, and where, where, the, where the devil will have his reign on the earth for just, for just a few years. But that moment isn't yet. And while we're here and while we're able to pray and to stand in the gap and to make up the hedge, that's what we've got to do because the end of this is destruction. The end of the, the the end of the our prodigals, the people that we love, that we've prayed with, that we've celebrated with, that we've hugged, that we've been, that, that we've we've danced in the spirit with, and then they've rejected Christ. The end of that is all of this stuff, and we don't want this stuff. So we've got to stand in the gap and make up the hedge. And we've got to preach with conviction and unction and passion. We've got to fight the, the, the temptation to compromise the word of truth because a soft gospel doesn't have power against hell. And this is the power of hell.